I am the most underappreciated character in the New Testament. Roman braggadocio? <laughs> no, just fact. Paul was brought to the judgment seat where the Jews issued a complaint to me. The way they worded it put me in a position to determine history. I'm not exaggerating. I held the future of Christianity in my hands. Yet few Christians even remember reading my name. Thanks a lot, Christians. Looking back over 2,000 years, it's easy to think that the success of Christianity was a sure thing. To the early Christ followers living three decades after Jesus, the very survival of Christianity was in question. Originally, my name was Lucius Aeneas Novatos, and I was born in Cordoba, Spain, about the time Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I was adopted by the famous orator Junius Gallio, which is where I got my biblical name, Gallio. I was the highest ranking Roman official in the province of Achaia for a short period of time. I was politically persecuted during the reign of Nero, so I committed suicide. I was the proconsul of Achaia during a period in 51 to 52 AD, which is one of the sure dating methods to know when this event with the Christians happened. Achaia was an area in Greece. I had complete authority in Achaia, including the power over life and death of anyone. The only mention of me in the Bible is in Acts 18 verses 12 to 17. To the well-informed, these five verses reveal a seismic shift in Christian history. Paul is nearing the end of the second missionary journey. He's living with Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth. He's been in the city for less than 18 months. Together, they establish a growing church, a church full of people with problems. Where there's people, there's problems, so I feel a little sorry for Paul. I know what it's like to manage a bunch of people. Corinth is a wealthy city because it controls the isthmus that separates the Peloponnese landmass from the mainland of Greece, and it is home to all kinds of foreigners, also sailors and thieves. Corinth is known empire-wide for being wild. I rule over Corinth, full of troublemakers. I will try to conceal the smirk that always comes to my face as I turn to these five verses in Acts. Listen. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made a concerted complaint and brought Paul to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Before Paul could open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or serious crime, I would listen to you. But it is a question of words and names of your law. You figure it out, for I won't be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then the crowd took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio didn't care. And I didn't care. The judgment seat sat near the middle of the city, and a replica exists there in modern times. It's a popular tour site. But the time of my administration, a fearsome place to visit. In Greek, this judgment seat is called the Bema, the same type of judgment seat mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When the Jews dragged Paul to the judgment seat, they complained that he persuaded people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. The way the complaint was worded, well, let's just say they didn't see what was coming. When I was in Corinth, the emperor was Claudius. However, two years later, he would die and be replaced by his adopted son, Nero. Nero's tutor for many years and his most trusted advisor for many more years was none other than my brother Seneca, the famous Stoic philosopher. See, I wasn't just any Roman official. I had immense indirect authority and influence because Seneca was my brother. Nobody in the empire would treat my judgments lightly. 
I could have interpreted the Jews' complaint to be that Paul was breaking Roman law by persuading people to worship in an illegal way. That complaint was very logical and obvious. Of all the people in the empire, only the Jews were exempt from worshiping the emperor. Everybody else had to do so. The penalties for not worshiping the emperor included death. In addition to the emperor, everyone in the empire was allowed to worship Roman gods or local Corinthian gods. Worship of anything else was illegal. Well, Paul was most certainly not worshiping the emperor, Roman gods, or local Corinthian gods. Under examination, Paul would most likely be found guilty of trying to corrupt the local population by getting them to worship his God. My second option was to interpret the complaint to be that Paul was teaching people to worship the Jews' God in ways not according to the Jewish laws of Moses. Well, Paul most certainly was a Jew. He most likely was worshiping the Jewish God. If I went that way, it was obvious that they were not accusing Paul of doing anything illegal according to Roman law, and they had no reason to be bothering me. It was an easy choice for me. I didn't like Corinth, and I didn't especially like the Jews in Corinth. I didn't want to be bothered by them and their internal quarrels, so I took the second choice. Told them so, kicked them out of court. Problem solved. Mm. The Jews were so angry with their leaders' incompetence to effectively represent them, they beat them in front of me. I just smiled. They were doing what I could have ordered my soldiers to do. Save me the hassle. Now, <laughs> you might be saying, Gallio, that simple ruling did not change history. You were nothing more than a loudmouth, egotistical, showboating show-off. And if so, you were not paying close attention. Because of me, Paul had a ruling from a powerful, well-known official that Christianity was essentially a Jewish sect. The Christians could claim the same rights as the Jews, that they were part of an officially recognized religious group that could worship their own God and not have to worship the emperor. Therefore, Christians could now claim that they were exempt from emperor worship and were legally allowed to worship the God of the Jews. I gave them a powerful shield when I could have handed them over to be persecuted by the Roman Empire that would have killed every known Christian in a very short period of time. Bye-bye, Christians. My ruling was advantageous to the Christians for about another decade. Then as the Jews rebelled against the Romans and Nero became more deranged, the Christians would want to be identified separately. My ruling gave them the breathing room they needed to become more established and numerous so they could have their own identity as a separate group. You're welcome, Christians. Now, my ruling had another very beneficial side effect for the Christians. By not having a long, drawn-out trial in front of a famous official, the Christians got to stay in the shadows for a much longer time. Good job, Christians. It was many more decades before the officials of the Roman Empire paid much attention at all to the Christians. And when they finally did, the Christians were well established, not the least because they had time to write and compile their sacred writings that you may know today as the New Testament. So come on, remember me. Not a brag, fact. I did change the course of history for the Christians. And that changed the course of history for the entire world. Again, Christians, you're welcome.